What are you looking at? <coughs> Said the scary guy to the out-of-town tourist in an alley in the wrong part of the city. What are you looking at? Said the frustrated husband to his distracted wife while they were out on a date, a romantic dinner, as she just stared at the couple, the young couple that was arguing two tables over. What are you looking at? Said the older sister to the younger brother, whose eyes were still wide open after their father just severely scolded her. What are you looking at? Said the concerned and disappointed mother to her curious teenage son. What are you looking at is the question that God wanted his Old Testament people to ask themselves as they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years waiting to take possession of the promised land. What are you looking at is the question that God wants us to ask ourselves as we walk through the week, walk through the work week, navigating life's highs and lows, its twists and turns. You may recall that God had led his people out of Egypt miraculously and that they were going to go to the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. You may recall that they were forced, sentenced by God himself, however, to wander in that wilderness for 40 years. You know, that wasn't the original plan. The original plan was to leave Egypt, go through the Red Sea, and then travel a little to the north and a little to the east through the Sinai Desert, to that land flowing with milk and honey, a, a journey of a couple hundred miles. You may recall that as they got close to that land flowing with milk and honey, they sent a few spies, 12 of them, to check out the land. Oh, and they were impressed. They were impressed with the fruit and the vegetables, the vegetation, the milk, the honey, all of it. But they came back and they said, there's no way. There's no way we'll ever take possession of this land God has promised to us. The people there are too big. They're too highly skilled. They're too well trained. We're like little grasshoppers compared to these people. They're going to squash us like grapes if we try to take possession of this promised land. Do you ever just stop back when you hear that? You've heard these Bible stories before and you think, how in the world could they ever doubt God. How could they ever fail to put their trust in the one who had just miraculously freed them from slavery in Egypt, devastating that entire country, that, that entire people with those miraculous and powerful plagues? Yet he can't give them the land of Canaan. They doubted. They failed to put their trust in the God who had miraculously parted the Red Sea so that they, all two million of them, could cross on dry ground only to turn around and look that wall of water on the left, that wall of water on the right, come tumbling down on top of the Egyptian army and destroy all of them. Failed to trust. God. They, they failed to trust the God who visibly, wouldn't this be awesome if God would visibly lead us with a pillar of cloud by day? Pillar of fire by night, his abiding presence. Never question, is God with me? And yet they failed. They failed to trust God. And so God said, okay. You know what? None of you, age 20 and older, none of you are going to enter the promised land. You are going to wander in this wilderness for 40 years. I will raise up a new generation, the next generation of Israelites, and they will take possession of this land flowing with milk and honey. Well, we'll fast forward 38 years, and guess what? Not much has changed. This next generation, this new generation of Israelites could grumble and complain with the best of them. 
They could be just as impatient. They could fail to trust God just as well. They could doubt him just as easily, if not more, than their fathers had. Now granted, there was the straw that broke the camel's back. They were getting very close to the promised land and one nation, one country, one king stood in their way. It was the king of Edom, a distant relative, but he refused safe passage through their country. You're going to have to either go through me or go around me, he said. Moses, path of least resistance, says, we'll go around, but a much longer route and a route with a far more difficult terrain pass. This is where our sermon text picks up. The people are growing impatient. The desert is hot. The desert is desolate. The desert is dry. And they begin to grumble and they complain to Moses, really to God, why? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt only to die in the desert? Remember, that was 38 years ago. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. What were they looking at? They were looking at what they had, and it wasn't good enough. They were looking at what they didn't have, and they became angry. They were looking at the way God was taking care of them. And they grumbled and they complained, forgetting that God had freed them from slavery. Remember how much they were grumbling back then? How much they heard mom and dad grumble around the dinner table about this captivity they had in Egypt? They grumbled and they complained about the manna, the bread that God gave them every morning. Complained about the quail, the protein, the meat God gave them every evening to eat. They complained they complained about the water God had provided for them in the middle of the wilderness, middle of the desert. They had water to drink. They complained if they'd only looked at the soles of their feet. They complained that, that the God who had seen to it that their shoes wouldn't wear out for those 40 years wasn't taking care of them. The way they grumbled, the way they complained was really a slap in the face. Slap in the face to God as they looked at what they had and it wasn't good enough. As they looked at what they didn't have and it made them angry. You know the question's coming, right? What are we looking at? As we walk through each week, as we go through life, navigate its highs and lows, its twists and turns, what are we looking at? What we have or what we don't have? The good or just the bad? Our lot in life, knowing that it's not very much? Or someone else's lot in life that seems to be so much bigger? What are we looking at? Those things that are only going to invoke feelings of envy and jealousy and discontent and, and cause us to complain? Or the other side, or are we looking at those things that are going to give us some uh, feeling of pride and self-confidence and self-worth that, that really, in the end, can, can only let us down? No, Pastor, I, actually, I'm looking at God. Okay. Concede the point. We look at God. We, we look at the God who created the heavens and the earth. We look at the God who knit us together in our mother's wombs. We look at the God who gave us our bodies and souls, eyes, ears, and all our, our members. We look at the God who gives us our daily bread. We look at the God who, who assured us that we're much more valuable to him than the birds of the air or the lilies of the field. We look at the God who told us very clearly that he has a plan for each one of us, and it's a good one. We look at the God who didn't spare his own son but gave us up for us all, and then rhetorically asks himself, how will I not also along with him graciously give them all things? And still we complain. And still we grumble. And still we're discontent. Looking even at him. Perhaps we feel that sting. 
on our own hands, slapping God in the face. We know what God did in the wilderness some several thousand years ago. He sent venomous snakes among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people died. Are there consequences for sin? Yes, absolutely. Did God have a plan? Did he have a purpose, a loving plan, a loving purpose for sending those snakes among the people? Most definitely. God's plan was to use those snakes to bite the people back to repentance. And it worked. As they saw people around them dropping dead from that poisonous venom, they saw their sin. That's what they were looking at. They were looking at their heart. They were overcome with sorrow and guilt, called contrition, and they confessed their sin. They went to Moses, a mediator, a goal between, between them and, and God, and they, they said, pray for us. Ask God to forgive us. Ask God also, please, to take those snakes away. There's a lot about that Old Testament people that we don't want to follow, that we don't want to mimic, we don't want to follow their example so many different times, so many different ways, but here's one we can what are we looking at? Let's each look at our own hearts. Let's each look at our own image in the mirror of God's holy law. Let, let's each look at our, our own sin and, and God bring us to repentance. Work that same contrition and sorrow in our hearts and, and let's, let's turn to our mediator, capital M. And let's ask God for his help. Let's ask God for his forgiveness. Moses prayed. He prayed on behalf of the people. Pray that God would take the snakes away. God heard Moses' prayer and he did answer it, although he didn't take the snakes away, did he? Instead, he told Moses to make a snake, a brand, brand, brass snake, a bronze serpent, make it and put it up on a pole and then tell the people to look at it. That's what they were to look at, a bronze snake up on a pole. But he also attached a promise that's a promise. Whenever they looked at that snake, if they were bitten, if they looked at the snake, God would see to it that they wouldn't die. The venom wouldn't kill them. What, what were they doing? What were they looking at? They were looking at a snake, but they were trusting. Not the snake, but God. Believing not in any power of the snake, but believing the power and promise of God. And it worked. Whenever anyone was bitten by that snake, they could look at the bronze snake and God would see to it that they wouldn't die. We haven't been bitten by venomous snakes in, in the desert, in the wilderness. But that deadly serpent, that deceptive snake, did sink his fatal fangs into each one of us with a fatal venom, eternally fatal venom. When he first tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, with discontent, right? All the other fruit wasn't good enough. You've got to have this one. We grumble, we complain, right? I don't have anything to wear! As we try to jam our clothes into the dresser drawer just so it'll close. Or as we trip over a pile of laundry. Maybe it's a dirty pile. Maybe it's the folded pile of laundry that we still need to put away. There's nothing to eat in this house. As we move and rummage from, from cupboard to fridge to pantry to freezer. Complain about the, how high the car payment is, forgetting that just a few months ago we were complaining about the car we had at the time wasn't good enough. We look around, we have big dreams for our house. Renovation, remodel, a new a new address, and then we grumble and we complain when, when God makes those things a reality, but we're never around to enjoy them because we're so busy working to pay for it. What are we looking at? We look not at a bronze snake up on a pole when we see our sin, but we look at God's Son. Jesus Christ, who was lifted up. Lifted up not on a pole, but on the cross for our sin. Jesus made that comparison for us. 
gospel reading today, John chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish. As we walk through the week, as we navigate life's highs and lows, twists and turns, as we see our sin, what are, what are we looking at? Not a snake, but a Savior. Not a criminal on that cross, but a king. And not weakness. What are we looking at? Not weakness. We heard that last week, right? Not weakness, but strength. What are we looking at? Not blood, but, but payment, the ransom price. What are we looking at? We look at Jesus on the cross. What are we looking at? The next three weeks, not death, but life. Our life. Our eternal life in him. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Please stand.